And now at this time, Father Lawrence Frizzell will offer the opening prayer. First, I would mention that this evening, the 27th of October, is, of course, the evening before the declaration on the church's relation with non-Christian religions was promulgated on October 28th, 1965. Monsignor John Oesterreicher was among those who work to prepare for this document and uh, and so we honor his memory this evening. The topic of Rabbi Burrell's lecture provokes a, a reflection on the mystery of God. And so I turned to one of the many, many texts that we could choose. I turned to the fourth book of Esdras. In chapter 14, verses 1 to 5. Ezra, the scribe, the great teacher and priest, was considered by many to be a second Moses. <clears throat> and so when we look at the book, fourth book of Ezra, we find this text. A voice came out of the bush, Ezra, Ezra. Here am I, Lord, he said. And he said to me, I revealed myself in a bush and spoke to Moses when my people were in bondage in Egypt. And I sent him and he led my people out of Egypt and I led him up to Mount Sinai where I kept him for many days. And he told, and I told him, many wondrous things and showed him the secrets of the times and declared to him the end of times. Lord, we do stand in your presence and at your service. Help and guide our efforts to understand your guiding light as we ponder the signs of your divine love. And may all that we do this evening before the glory of your name. Amen. Thank you, Father Frizzell. Once again, we return to Father Lawrence Frizzell, Director of the Institute of Judeo-Christian Studies and Associate Professor in the Graduate Program in Jewish Christian Studies, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mellon. <clears throat> Monsignor John Esterreicher and I went to a meeting in New York, in Manhattan in 1977. It was a meeting of the editors of journals, of religious journals, both Jewish and Christian. And as we gathered, one of the Jewish editors looked around and said, you know, this is the first time that we have got together as Jews to meet each other as editors of great journals. Now among those editors was of course, the editor of the Orthodox journal called Tradition. This was Rabbi Walter Wurzberger who was a very esteemed gentleman, much appreciated in the community. And this meeting drew us all into the realization that studies and sharing of our goals in life can be very important across across many, many boundaries over many fences, we might say. Now, a number of years later, Rabbi Wurzberger had the assistance of a young rabbi, Alan Brill. And in many ways, I see that Rabbi Brill has, in a, has succeeded 
what by Wurzberger was trying to accomplish was doing as an editor and as a theologian, as a great thinker in the Orthodox tradition. And so we were very pleased when Rabbi Brill could join us here at Seton Hall in 2007. The chair that was given by uh, Cooperman and Ross founders, this Cooperman Ross chair in honor of Sister Rose Thiering, the great teacher here at Seton Hall, was the beginning for Rabbi Burl's work with us. And over the 15 years that have passed, he has accomplished a great deal. And among those accomplishments is the reaching out to the religions that are mentioned in the in the in the declaration Nostra Aetate of 1965. So Rabbi Brill's publications and his lectures, uh, his interventions in, in, in many conferences have all contributed to uh, this advancement of learning and sharing among very religious various religious communities. And these have included those of South Asia and Southeast Asia in recent years. So I salute Rabbi Alan Brill for his great work. And we are proud that he is here with us at Seton Hall. And I invite him this evening to share with us his reflections on an, uh, an element of the great tradition that flows out of the script, sacred scriptures of Judaism and of course takes a new form in the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth and the early church. So I welcome you Rabbi Brill this evening. <clears throat> okay, thank you Father Frizzell and I thank Father Frizzell for his gracious invitation to deliver this lecture and I thank the Institute of Judeo-Christian Studies for supporting it. And I thank everyone involved in the Jewish Christian Studies program, which has been such a wonderful and supportive place to work, to grow, to interact with colleagues. Um, and as Father Frizzell said, I owe a debt to Rabbi Dr. Walter Wurzberger, who brought me into this as his shadow many years ago to, to follow him and see what he does. Um, and I also must point out before anything that in another 48 hours, I'm getting on a plane to go to the G20 summit, the R20 of religion and interfaith with all the world's religious leaders in which I am delivering a keynote address representing Judaism um, at the G20. But to get started for today, Today, I'm gonna to talk about a topic that Jews don't usually speak about, which is the Trinity. Jews have generally seen the Trinity as a tritheism, and certainly in past polemical ages, but now in our post-polemical age, how do we relate to the Trinity? And I could have off opened with a joke about Jewish lack of understanding of the Trinity, but instead I'm gonna start with a more meaningful story. I was in Rome in 2005 at the 40th anniversary of Nostra Aetate Conference. Among the many delegate speakers was a priest who was proud to tell me he studied at Hebrew University and he knew Hebrew. At one point over the course of the week, I was standing with my wife in front of Il Gesù Church in Rome, and this priest was also there. He walked up to us with great excitement and declared, can't you feel the Shechina here? My wife and I looked at each other and about this Hebrew rabbinic locution coming from this priest that he thought brought us together. Um, he was using a rabbinic and Kabbalistic word, Shechina, but what did he mean? On some level, 
to explain the difference between the Jewish and Catholic meanings will reveal the core of this talk. Mishnah Tractate Avot 3.2 reads, when two people are sitting together and there are words of Torah spoken between them, the divine presence, the Shechina, rests with them. In a similar manner, in Matthew 18.20, in the New Testament, it says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I present in the midst of them. Very similar statements. But for the latter, the book of Matthew, the divine presence is Christ, or as it eventually becomes formulated, the second person of the Trinity. While in the rabbinic literature, the divine presence is a free-floating signifier of divine relationship, which becomes formulated in later centuries in diverse ways, as divine providence, as a metaphor of approval, as an angel, as an apparition, as a Holy Spirit, or as a lower manifest manifestation of the divine as part of the Ten Svirot. What is the Shechina in Judaism? Not the second person of a trinity, for the rational philosopher of Maimonides, it could be a created entity of light or a metaphor of divine province. For some Jewish statements, it's an angel. And for Nachmanides, the Kabbalist, it's a lower manifestation of the divine. But it's not a second person of the Trinity. The meaning of the Shekhinah for Jews is loose, but for Christians, it's quite fixed. Or to discuss the Trinity and my conclusions up front, Jewish, and I'll explain this as I go on, Jewish thought is modalist, not Trinitarian. Jewish thought is monarchist, not Trinitarian. Jewish thought is often docetic, not Trinitarian. Jewish thought leaves the terms for interdivine structure as free-floating, not as a fixed creed, able to produce a controversy like the Filioque controversy. And Jewish thought also at many points is Aryan, as in the Aryan controversy. So in short, as a means to foreshadow what I'll be saying, in a post-polemical age, the dividing lines between Jewish and Christian thinking about God is about modalism, monarchism, doceticism, Arianism, and fixed ideas in which Jews and Christians made very different decisions in the third and fourth centuries that underlie today's differences as well as today's convergences in a post polemical age. My goal is to open up new understandings of Judaism and maybe also for Christianity, but not to harmonize two distinct religions. To re now to return to the polemical age. In 1943, the author Trudy Weiss Rosemarin wrote a book, Judaism and Christianity, The Differences. It is treated as a classic and still the starting point on the congregational level. She sets out to show that the two religions, Judaism and Christianity, are fundamentally irreconcilable and contradictory. According to her, there are fundamental divides. Jews have undifferentiated monotheism, whereas the Christian, theity, the Christian Trinity is a concession to polytheism. My question tonight is whether the Jewish view of God and the Christian Trinity is that irreconcilable or not. My second question is what we can learn from this comparison. So during the post-Vatican II era, there was a period of getting acquainted Books and articles appeared concerning scripture, New Testament, Jewish history, anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, but little comparative theology. Even Mark Tannenbaum and Sion Buxer, or even Abraham Joshua Heschel did not seriously engage Christian theology on topics such as the Trinity. Since late 1990s, there's been a turn toward theology but almost all Jewish thinkers active at the time still considered Jewish, considered Christian theology, like the Trinity, incarnation, salvation, as inscrutable. Many Jewish thinkers in the 1990s believe that Jews can't understand the Trinity or Christian theology, and for them, that the very discussion 
is an ultimate impasse between Judaism and Christianity. However, despite the differences, maybe we can share discussions of natural law, morality grounded in the divine. Uh, the scholar Jacob Neusner offers a different form of difference, that of historic essentialism. Neusner created a normative for each side and compares the differences. Jacob Neusner picked as his fixed point the fifth century and shows that Christians care about belief, the Messiah, and atonement from the crucifixion, and Jews care about Torah study and the application of the law, meaning they have both two different agendas. So there's no point comparing one side's agenda to the other agenda. Jews have a God of the Jews and Christians have a Trinity. Neusner may not be entirely wrong, but in an age where Jews read Moltmann and Rahner and Christians read Heschel, Rosenzweig, and Levinas, we need to temper his essentialism. First, a word about my background. As a rabbi with a PhD in theology from Fordham University, I have a unique position for tonight's thought. Uh, having attended Fordham for my degree in theology, I was warmly welcomed with students of other faiths as a result of the changes brought forth from Vatican II. Today, I can teach Christian theology and do not find it incomprehensible. In fact, instead of tentatively learning to understand Christianity, like many of the rabbis of the 1960s, I find myself explaining arguments in Christology to Christians. And as somebody whose early research was on Kabbalah, and Jewish interdivine structures, I am always aware of the similarities and differences between Judaism and Christianity about their views of God. So the time has come to ask, can we have serious comparisons and contrast? A pioneer who tried was Pinchas Lapid, Israel's Milanese ambassador. He had a wonderful productive dialogue on theology with Jürgen Moltmann, Karl Rahner, and Hans Kung back in the 1970s and 80s. For Lapid, Judaism had many metaphysical and logos theories similar to Christianity, and he was willing to compare theologies. There's a great deal of valuable information and food for thought in those volumes. However, they're marred by the interview style and they're inconsistent recorded episodes without any follow-up but we still gain many insights from reading his first attempt. My position is that I don't believe it's a simple choice of same or difference, but there is an overlap of various different models of interconnection. My goal is to point out that popular theological language usually fails to break things down into component parts and looking at component parts will help us move beyond binary thinking of the difference between the religions. Now, interreligious comparisons are known as a field of tension between similarity and difference, between a sense of religious interconnection and a recognition of the distinctiveness of the other tradition. And I'm gonna respect that. Or as the sociologist Peter Berger put it, discussion should not just be on agreements, but also on disagreements an open-minded encounter with other religious possibilities. Now, my talk tonight is gonna to focus on the 20th century. But before I turn to the last 50 years with the theories of Rahner and Moltmann, I need to address differences in late antiquity where these differences became created. And I'm not coming to this as a scholar of late antiquity. I'm relying on the scholarship of late antiquity and what role it plays in the 20th century discussions. The first point is that many current scholars demonstrate there was a widespread sense of complex structures of the divine in first century Judaism, including bi-theism, Binitarianism within Judaism, where Jews perceived the transcendent God and also a lower logos of God. The idea of a complex Godhead, a God with two or three hypotheses, 
do have their origins in the Judaism of the first century and before. To consider one example that plays a large role for a Jewish understanding of early Christianity, which is bi-theism or binitarianism, a position where God has two aspects, a transcendent and a lower aspect. Peter Schaefer, the scholars Peter Schaefer and Larry Hurtado both show the complexity and overlap between views of the divine in various first century groups that will later coalesce into the divergent religions of Judaism and Christianity. Current historic research shows that during this time period, there was no pure Jewish monotheism contrasting with Christian the Trinity. Rather, Judaism had a more complex view, or as Daniel Boyarin puts it rather polemically, that Jews should stop vilifying Christian ideas about God as simply a collection of un-Jewish ideas. That many of these first century ideas continue in later Jewish thought and were not foreign to Jewish metaphysical concepts of God. The scholars Michael Fishbane, Moshe Edel, Yorah Lorberbaum, each in their own way, show a continuity of these early ideas and the later Jewish ideas. And contemporary scholars see these tendencies, these tendencies in the Talmud, in the Midrash, and certainly in medieval Kabbalah. Moshe Edel has a 600 page book on Jewish concepts of divine sonship, presenting Jewish thinking about God, including logos theories, interdivine structures, bi-theism. And my talk accepts this scholarship at face value, situating it as the, uh, in the world of the broad acceptance of this. In addition, we'll see that Jürgen Moltmann himself cites these Kabbalistic texts, and so do modern Jewish thinkers. In a volume of comparative views of the divine and ultimate reality, the pioneer in Jewish Christian scholarship, Anthony Saldarini, uh, used this historic material in a pioneering way to present Judaism as having a complex view of divinity, thereby displacing the pristine views of Judaism as ethical monotheism, found in many an early 20th century thinker, such as Hennerman Cohen, Leo Beck, and Martin Buber. But I must point out that these Jewish ideas of complex deity and bi-theism that are parallel to early Christian ideas are not directly historically related. Both are relying on a common scriptural tradition, common Second Temple sources, and common understandings of a multi-level monotheism. Point number two, high God. Paula Fredrickson, the scholar, notes that during the second century, Jews and, and Gentile Christians divided on the Jewish God, whereas Christians considered the high God of the Jewish tradition as the high God of the philosophers. Uh, early Gentile Christian theologians all insisted that the high God was the father of Christ, but some insisted with equal vehemence that the high God was not to be identified with the active deity of the Jewish scriptures. Hence, there has to be a lower son who acted in the Bible. For some of these Gentile Christian theologians in the second century, God the Father lost his Jewish identity and God the Father was seen as an abstract theos, the high God of all. And therefore the God of the Bible is the son who has changed passion, sorrow, love, and redeems. In, in contrast for Jews, the God of the Bible is the active God uh, and has a special relationship with the Jews with no need to distinguish between the God of the Bible and the God of the philosophers. Point number three, monarchism, okay? Monarchism is a uh, Catholic theological term, and for Judaism is monarchist, meaning that there is a hierarchy of divine parts. The Shina or Gvura or Kavod or any other name is lower than the infinite divine, the cause of causes. The Shina and the infinite divine are not indwelling together like the twin, like the Trinity. Christianity is expressed in the creed is explicitly anti-monarchist, rather it's perichoresis, meaning Father, Son, and Holy Spirit 
indwell within each other, and that is the creed. The Jewish approach is that, no, you can have levels of uh, the Holy One, blessed be he, and the Shekhinah as a monarchist system in which it's a hierarchy. The Christian position is always without hierarchy, and Judaism's hierarchy is the Christian heresy of monarchism. Um, fourth and final premise, modalism. Modalism, another early Christian heresy, is where the divine parts are just modes or attributes of one God, such as the view of most Jewish philosophers who assume one God has the many attributes of an all-knowing, all-powerful, and benevolent. Karl Barth and many 19th century thinkers share modalism with Judaism, but the thinkers we're going to look at tonight uh, are going to reject this. In contrast, Christianity of the Creed affirms that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, are of the same person who is with given different names as he exercises different functions, but they're not just modes of an undifferentiated unity. Jews who are Jewish philosophers treat all the variations in God language as just attributes, as modes, not as three persons. And Jews spent half a millennium under Islam where Jews accepted the Kalam and emphasized the absolute oneness of God. While Christianity in Europe developed the personalist thought under Peter Abelard, Richard of St. Victor's, and others. Um, but nevertheless, medieval Jewish philosophers, such as Sadia Gan in the 10th century, saw that Jews, Christians, and Muslims shared a belief in monotheism. Okay. So therefore, let's turn to a medieval example before going to the modern era. In the 13th century, Nachmanides, the great uh, Garona Kabbalist and rabbinic scholar and polemicist in his disputation with Pablo Christianity wrote as follows. Fray Pablo asked me in Garona whether I believed in the Trinity. Nachmanides said to him, what is the Trinity? Pablo said, wisdom, will, and power. Then I said, Nachmanides speaking, Rather, he and his wisdom are one, he and his will are one, he and his power are one, and if so, wisdom, will, and power are one. And even if God has accidental qualities, they would not be a trinity. There'd be one substance with three accidental properties. Meaning, in short, Nachmanides, like most medieval Jews, gave a modalist answer that at best, all these different words and attributes of God are only modes of an undifferentiated God which is not the Christian answer of perichoresis. And even the Jewish philosopher Isaac Abelag, Abelag said, if Christians were to frame things as modalism, then we can agree. Now I'm gonna to come to contemporary times. And in our post-polemical age, we're gonna look carefully at two Christian thinkers, two influential Christian thinkers, Karl Rahner and Jürgen Moltmann, and that's going to be the core of tonight's talk. Karl Rahner, who died in 1984, was a German Jesuit priest who is widely considered to have been one of the foremost Roman Catholic theologians of the 20th century. He is best known for his integration of existential philosophy of personalism with Thomistic realism. He was an influential presence at Vatican II and was personally friendly with Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. In a very dense volume, Rahner formulates his modern differences from the classical formulations or the medieval formulations of the Trinity. Most notably, Rahner says that today we avoid the word person about the Trinity. Rahner writes that in the modern era, Okay, writing in the 1960s, person means consciousness and activity, but originally person only meant concrete substance. The very same thing, concrete substance in three modes. The Trinity, 
for Rahner does not have three persons in the modern sense of the word in that they do not have three separate consciousnesses. The term he uses to describe the three parts of the Trinity are three existence ways of one God, albeit relative, all is one essence in unity. In addition, if the parts are not separate, there is no classic procession of the Father unoriginated to the Son begotten and both to the Spirit in a procession. In Karl Rahner's view, all proceeds from the Father alone and the three subsistings of the Trinity are to can be considered as modes of a single God. There is one divine essence and all the proceeds from the Father in which the bond of the Father to the other two is relative. Catholic theologians usually repeat a standard set of evaluations of Rahner's view of the Trinity. Among these include that Rahner is rather weak on preserving the role of the persons of the Trinity, and that this is close to the charge of modalism. But these criticisms actually bring the view of Trinity closer to a Jewish perspective. But our question is how close is Rahner, the 20th century thinker, now to a 20th century Jewish perspective? Since modalism is a position that Judaism can accept, it is important to reflect a bit longer on the question of Rahner's modalism. Mark Pugliese, in an important article, Is Karl Rahner a Modalist? concludes that Rahner is not a modalist, but the conclusion of the article may have put its finger on the Jewish-Christian divide, and this is where we should be thinking now. For Pugliese, the question of modalism can be reduced to two chief concerns. First, whether Rahner's theory can lead to denying necessary eternal numerical distinctions in God, which are fundamental to God's being, which would ultimately be Unitarian without essential distinctions. Basically, Pugliese asks, is Rahner a Unitarian? Second, Rahner says God is only one absolute person, not a plurality of three subjectivities and individual consciousnesses. Rahner seeks to explain what the church means by person. They are not mass divorced from the content of the deity, but rather without them, the substantiality of real deity could not exist. The position that Rahner rejects is that the persons are mere created masks and not essential or identical with the one individual God behind them, but that is in fact the Jewish position. So the second point is whether this could ever be explained as just a one and not a three. Are they just masks? And Pugliese says, no, the, the Trinity is always a Trinity, defending Rahner. But that itself shows you the difference between the Jewish position. For, the, for Judaism, the lower interdivine structures are on some level mere masks and never have their own independent volition. In Kabbalah, the Spherot expressed God without an identity other than the one God. They lack independence. That is why they are the, um, called in Judaism emanations. God makes them as forces or mediums to interact with the world and for the world to relate to him. They can be treated as God's mechanism. So the dividing line now becomes for Jews, anything other than the individual in this divisible God is only a mask or something created by God, but they don't have their own volition. Here we're having in contrast, Christianity is a trinity. Still, the Kabbalah is only one strand within Judaism. The contemporary Jewish Aristotelian or Neo-Kantian Jewish philosopher would not tolerate any interdivine parts. By contrast, the, the doctrine of the trinity is the very heart of Christianity. Okay, and as you can see, I'm comfortable reading books about uh, the Trinity and Christology. Point number two, Jürgen Moltmann. 
Jürgen Malkin, professor of systematic theology at the University of Tübingen in Germany, is one of the most widely read theologians of the second half of the 20th century. I'll deal with his early work where he freely engages with Jewish thought. Now in his 90s, he is still writing and he's actively engaged with dialogue with Jewish scholars. And we're gonna see what that's gonna produce. He has a self-proclaimed distinctly Christian understanding of God that he knows is not Jewish. For Maltman, the cross of the sun stands from eternity in the center of the Trinity. Maltman focuses not only on the suffering of God, but even on the suffering in God. Maltman's doctrine of God does not begin with the divine unity, either as one substance nor the one substance, but, but Maltman starts with a divine plur plurality evidenced in the divine mission of the Trinity. He is a social doctrine of the Trinity in which you need the parts of the Trinity. But let me back up a minute. Maltman saw the carnage and tragedy of World War II and therefore he wants to start his thought from the sense of suffering of World War II, especially of the Holocaust and the tragedy to the Jewish people. He uses the Jewish thought of Elie Wiesel on the Holocaust and Heschel's most moved mover to formulate a, a Christian response. He seeks to create a Trinitarian view in which God shares in our suffering and he looks to Jewish sources. Moltmann writes that it's not merely possible to see Golgotha and Auschwitz in a single perspective. It's actually necessary for a Christian at the end of the 20th century. Parenthetically, there was a debate 50 years ago about Moltmann's approach. Many 1970s Christian theologians of the Holocaust <laughs> Can everyone please close your microphones? Thank you. Uh, such as a, such as A. Roy Eckhart and Rosemary Reuter, blame the Holocaust directly on Christian teaching, not distinguishing between the teaching of contempt and the teaching of the Trinity. Father Palakowski remembers this time, and it was a reason for the lack of such of a discussion we are having tonight, when these discussions were rather pushed away. Be that as it may, Maltman sets out his view of the Trinity in three parts. He structures it even as a Trinity. And the first part is on God's self-distinction and indwelling. In a crucial section of his book, The Trinity and the Kingdom, on the pathos of God, which is on the activity of the second person of the Trinity, Maltman discusses the passion of God based on Jewish sources. And Maltman thinks that Jews and Christians come from the same spiritual neighborhood. That's his phrase. Maltman asserts that the very Christian ideas of incarnation of the divine logos and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit developed in the same spiritual neighborhood as the Jewish ideas of exile and rabbinic Shkina theology. Maltman writes that Tertullian's formulation of the Trinity is, of course, using the terminology of Greek philosophy of Neoplatonism, but Maltman concludes as the, Neo Testament, as the New Testament shows an actual fact. The Trinity goes back to an Israelite theology of the Shekhinah, the God who lives in heaven and among the wretched of his people, re reveals a double presence. And Maltman quotes Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel in his interpretation of the prophets about the importance of bipolarity, in which there is both the God of the unknown and the God is manifest here that the rabbinic mystical doctrine of the Shekhinah is one of the primary theological frameworks that Maltman uses to interpret his own work, as well as the world's experience of suffering. Maltman starts his Trinitarian thought in this work with Wiesel's experience as a shattering expression representative of the rabbinic theology of God's humiliation of himself. However, Maltman concludes that whereas the Jewish understanding of the Shekhinah tradition perceive the kind of double presence, the Christian experience is a triple presence. For Maltman, 
It's about, about a shared first century interdivine structure. Mopin uses Heschel and Pathos against the passionless God, a divine self humiliation forms of the Shrina. Mopin's God is a God who is freely affected and changed by the suffering world. Mopin also uses the, the thought of Franz Rosenzweig on the Shrina, in which God suffers with us. For Mopin, the people suffer exile and persecution, and the Shrina suffers with them. The Shrina suffers exile, and the people suffer with the Shrina. Maltman actually sees this in the rabbinic Mishnah of Sanhedrin 6.5, and he quotes the Mishnah. When a human being suffers, what does the Shrina say? My head is too heavy for me. My arm is too heavy for me. And if God is grieved over the blood of the wicked that is shed, how much more so over the blood of the righteous? So Maltman provides us with a Christian reading of the Mishnah as affirming the second person of the Trinity. Abraham Joshua Heschel developed the bipolar concept of God, wherein God is at once wholly free in God's self, and at the same time committed to the people of God in covenant. Picking up on this concept, Moltmann asserts, and I quote, Heschel has shown that the Jewish experience of God cannot be a simple monotheism, because on the basis of the experience of the divine pathos, it must come to an awareness of the self-distinction of God. Every self-communication presupposes a self-distinction. Whoever speaks of the communicability of God presumes a relationship in which God can step over God. But I must point out, despite Moltmann's reading, Jews do not read it as a simple, as a two persons in God. Heschel is talking about a hierarchy. Uh, but we're seeing that he's playing off and reading a trinity into a Jewish hierarchical text. Moltmann notes another difference from Judaism, that unlike, Christian, that, un, that unlike Christianity, the deliverance by God is in the hands of human beings. Human action is what counts in Judaism, according to Moltmann, in that a Jew does mitzvot, a Jew does the endless customs and rituals, commandments, customs, and precepts for the sake of unifying the holy God and his shrina, which is not in the Christian tradition. Moltmann's second movement of the Trinity, God's self-humiliation. Moltmann's second movement of the Trinity uses the Kabbalistic concept of the Shrina as presented by Gershon Shalom. Can the omnipotent and omnipresent God have an outward aspect at all? In order to answer this question, Moltmann turns to the Jewish mystic Isaac Luria and his concept of simsum, contraction. According to Gershon Shalom, as read by Moltmann, simsum, divine contraction, means concentration or contraction, and in Kabbalistic thought, signifies a withdrawal into the self. Luria, taking up a Midrashic think teaching originating in the third century that refers to concentrating his Shrina, is transformed by Moltmann into God concentrated. And the way Moltmann understands the contraction, God has released a certain sector of his being from which he has withdrawn, a kind of primal myth, mythical space, and into this accordingly, he can issue from himself into his creation and his revelation. This means that the exodus of creation begins with the self-humiliation of God's part when he determines to be self-limited. It is through this withdrawal, this exile into God's own self, that allows for the nihilo in which God then actively creates. Transposing this into a Trinitarian key, Moltmann writes the relationship of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is so wide, the whole creation can find space, time, and freedom in it. Simpson to Moltmann means incarnation and kenosis, Catholic terms, Christian terms, which he identifies with the, with the Jewish idea of the Shrina and the Jewish idea of Simpson. <laughs> but my only reaction to that is no, no, no. For Jews, contraction, Simpson does not mean the Shrina. And the Trinity is not a contraction. For Jews, the Simpson, the contraction, is a hollow, a gap, 
an euphoria, something that went wrong, a hollow. For Jews, the emanation of the cosmos of the divine is a hierarchy. For Jewish thought, Simpson, the contraction is an empty space filled with divine light, not a description of the divine. For Maltman, Christ solves the void. For Jews, the void is the world itself, the structure of reality. For Jews, the contraction remains a hierarchical emanation. As might be expected, according to Maltman, God's self-humiliation, his symptom, is ultimately realized and is nowhere greater than the cross. Maltman presupposes self-humiliation inward, but symptom is a culmination of a history of divine self-humiliations, the goal of which is the very redemption of creation and reconciliation of all things in God. The Trinitarian event, as Maltman understands it, is deepened by the Shekhinah tradition because the son of the triune God, like the Shekhinah, participates in humankind's destiny, making the suffering of his people his own. The Shekhinah accompanies Israel into the humiliation of exile and their co-suffers in solidarity, awaiting redemption and return. Maltman argues that, the, that on the cross, the father and son are so deeply separated that the relationship is cut off while the son suffers death. The father suffers the death of the son. But once again, there's nothing like this in Judaism. For Judaism, the gl divine glory and the Shekhinah accompany Israel in the desert are a created lower level. Even the medieval Jewish philosophers such as Sadia and Maimonides discuss this as a projection or created object that illuminated the wandering of the Israelites in the desert, not as a perichoresis of the Trinity. And the third movement, God's redemption, while Moltmann departs from the Jewish Shekhinah tradition by understanding the eschatological union to be entrusted to the work of the third person spirit, he nevertheless makes room for the church's own participatory acts, and this is his term of tikkun olam. In uniting human beings with one another, the uniting of society with nature and the uniting of creation with God. For Jews, the Shekhinah is usually the equivalent of the third person in its role of the kingdom of God on earth. In contrast, the Holy Spirit is used by Jews to refer to everyday prophecy. Now I want to reflect on Maltman's Trinity and Shrina tradition. The Shrina tradition helps Maltman arrive at a divine unity with the theological concept of, an, of a mutual indwelling. But Jews don't see such an indwelling. It remains hierarchical, modalist, ascetic. How is he different on the more general issues? Jews have a self tikkun Jews do commandments, they do mitzvot, which for Christian thought will be Pelagian. It'll be a self-perfection to restore the world, which affirms the difference. For Jews, the action is entrusted to the action of Israelites and commandments, mitzvot. To use the Paul Ricoeur idea of a root metaphor, the difference of self-action of mitzvot for divine self or, or needing divine salvation are core differences in root metaphor. Maltman himself expresses reservations in the way he takes up the Jewish tradition. He admits the Jewish tradition does not permit the full and real presence of God in his Shrina and his spirit to be thought. The scholar Mueller Geico asks, does Maltman use of Judaism work? Is it compatibility or just a typology? Maltman himself seems unsure. He questions his own use of the Jewish tradition but then he goes ahead and uses it. Mueller Geico thinks Maltman has it both ways. For Geico, I have my doubts, and I quote, I have my doubts whether Jewish theologians could regard Maltman's arguments, which are all too quickly moved from questions through a supposition as a compelling exegesis, yet Maltman himself tries to close the gap between Judaism and Christianity. So what do I take from these comparisons? For Christians, the Trinity is a fixed theological view of God affirmed in the creed and liturgy. However, the whole rainbow of Jewish experience of God is and remains a gallery of verbal images, which neither are now nor have ever been stone hard concepts, 
on which one could build a solid knowledge of God. All these images are metaphors from the unknowable. Judaism has no fixed divine configuration, so it varies from philosophic negative theology to a divine of thousands of parts, from philosophic metaphor to Hindu complexity. For Jews, God as father is only a metaphor for the relationship of the Jewish people and God. It's not a real relationship of God and father and son as in Christianity. And, in, and the Shekhinah in Judaism is often portrayed as feminine, bridal, an image of fecundity and mothering, in some ways making it closer either to Hindu imagery or later Marian devotion. Yet, regarding theology in general, Rahner and Moltmann's willingness to enter into theological dialogue with various Jewish scholars discussed above stands as an exemplar model of the many possibilities authentic interreligious discussions can produce. Leonard Swindler, the master of interfaith, writes in his foreword to the publication of the Lapid Moltmann Dialogue that this particular conversation alone yielded exciting new insights into the meaning of reality that neither alone had more than an inkling of. As a result, each is more profoundly a Jew and a Christian, respectively. But at the same time, they're more profoundly closer to each other. Moltmann's indebtedness to the Shana tradition is a particular example of this promise of comparative theology. A modal the Trinitarian position such as Rahner's is less different than a philosophic understanding of Judaism, and the greater a Trinitarian position veers to separate persons with volition, the greater the difference from Judaism. So rather than monotheism versus tritheism, we have after Rahner, we have a debate over the role of volition in interdivine structures. Does the Shrina have volition and is it eternally necessary or not? That's a very different place to wind up. But even this comparison is not clear black or white of same or difference. And the Jewish difference from Moltmann is more fundamental, but it's about persons, hierarchy, the nature of religious language. Rahner's near modalism without familiar relationships allows Jews to say that his view is similar for many purposes to the Jewish view. The difference would be that Rahner assumes that God's co-indwelling, the perichoresis, is needed as an act of self-communication. Judaism, in contrast, can envision God without essential distinctions. And Moltmann's dynamic movements in the divine world make some sense to a Kabbalistic reading of Judaism as well as those modern Jewish thinkers who use forms of Kabbalistic thought, such as Rosenzweig, Heschel, and Rabbi Cook, even if they would have immediately rejected Moltmann's formulations out of hand. Yet to these thinkers, Moltmann's view of a dynamic movement would be alternate schemes of the divine, not a different conception of God. Moltmann made an important declaration that the very Christian ideas of the incarnation of the divine logos and the indwelling of divine spirit developed in the same spiritual neighborhood, and the Jewish ideas of exile of the divine and Shekhinah the theology were developed in very different directions, nevertheless. I have dealt with two credo high, Christo high Christology thinkers, Moltmann and Rahner. However, if we look to non-Trinitarian thinkers, such as Oneness Protestants or many in Anabaptist, we'll have even more to reframe our discussion. So what do we learn from this exercise? Cardinal Casper in his book on the Trinity, which I did not discuss tonight, reminds us that the Trinity is a unique Christian understanding of God, which is unlike the unique Jewish understanding of God, even if both are based on the Hebrew Bible and the thought of early centuries. I do not want to ally the differences or make the Jewish and Christian readings as the same. I do not want to confuse or conflate the two religions, but I do want to move beyond the view that the widespread Jewish position that it's a, a pristine monotheism versus a tritheism in Jewish eyes. At this point, we have already undone the binary assumptions of Trudy Weiss-Rosemarin, 
who made Judaism and Christianity diametrically opposed. And the two religions are not different in a zero sum way, either historically or conceptually. Rather, some elements are the same and some elements are different. They have had mutual influence on each other, but in the end, the two religions remain as two distinct religions with different theological views of covenant, sin, and redemption. These different views create different views of liturgy, spirituality, and homiletics. Nevertheless, I still seek conceptual understanding and mutual edification. Many Jewish theologians have entirely avoided any discussion of the complexity of the Jewish conception of God, or they've foreclosed any discussion of theological, simi theological similarities with Christianity before the discussions have even begun. Rather than irreconcilable, non-comparable differences, we now can explore a variety of relationships, parallel, divergent, convergent, and we can begin to understand each other as well to be able to engage in a comparative theological practice. In the end, our two religions have two different views of covenant. For Jews, covenant means circumcision, Sabbath, and the Torah. And for Christians, covenant is an opening to God's saving presence to Christ. Tonight's talk is a part of a larger project, which will be published as a book by Fortress Press in uh, 23 or 24, comparing the two religions on origin and sin, incarnation, salvation, and covenant, as well as Trinity in a post polemical age. I think its tentative title is a Jewish Trinity, question mark, sin, salvation, and incarnation. Now, if this was a classroom in my comparative, theolo comparative theologies class, I would now construct a chart on the board giving a dozen criteria of same or difference, and we can then map out same di di difference, convergence, divergence. I can even add a third chart for Islam. But here in this context, I will conclude back on the steps of Ilgesu in Rome on that breezy autumn day when my colleague priests saw commonality over the Shekhinah of the common first century ideas. It did not create commonality as much as both commonality and difference. Much has happened in the 17 years since that meeting. Jewish scholars now speak regularly in Christian schools. Christian scholars speak in Jewish schools. We both regularly read each other's works. And many Jews have degrees uh, that include um, comprehensives on Christianity and Christians have comprehensives on Judaism. This talk would not have occurred 17 years ago when the elder scholars on both sides still were learning about each other and still saw irreconcilable differences. Now we have to start comparing, and I hope this talk will be the start of many conversations of even greater understanding. Now I'll take some questions. <laughs> Ira, unmute yourself if you're speaking. Thank you, Rabbi Brill. At this time, we will take questions as you suggested. Please remember to send your questions by email to j.wolferman at shu.edu. Thank you. Since we're not having a, a, a rush of emails, if you anybody has would like to speak, um, if you uh, click on the reaction button above, 
on the top of the screen, there's a raise your hand feature. If you'd like to use that as well, we could uh, we could take questions that way as well, as long as we have you know one person at a time. OK, um, Nazar, if you'd like to make your uh, present your question, please feel free to un un unmute yourself. Uh, thank you. Um, quick question. The fact that there was a I don't know, antagonism between rabbinic Judaism and emerging Jewish Christianity and then Christianity at large, which included the Gentiles. Uh, would you say that some of these ideas which might have been developed very closely had to be separated? In other words, both sides wanted them to keep separate and not to be close by, you know, in other words, if if let alone, they would be much closer, but they were separated somewhat artificially or intentionally. OK, so good to hear from you. Um, the. Yes, there was definitely the Judaism and Christianity went out of its way to separate themselves to show they are different systems, that they are not the same, that the same spiritual neighborhood of the first century was not what we had by the fourth or sixth centuries, where they went out of their way to differentiate themselves, especially as the centuries went on, in which there are clear moments and things that were seen as Judaizing on the Christian part or being too close to Christianity on the Jewish part. But then we've got the second level of, since most Jews lived under medieval Islam, Jews were widely familiar with various forms of Kalam, and therefore they accepted some of Kalam's pushing away of uh, Christian doctrines and formulated themselves, um, usually in line with the Mutakalaman system, and accepted only so much as that would allow. I, I Does see, that answer so, your question? Yeah, it's like it's a it's a dual system. There is the Islamic anti-Christianity or anti-Greek attitudes of you know Islamic theologians, plus that first level I I was talking and you reiterated. Yeah, uh, I see. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. You're very welcome. Much. We have another question in the chat uh, from uh, uh, Louis Velo. By analogy, can Trinity be aligned with Keter, Chokma and Bina? So in not in Judaism and not in 20th century uh, Christian thought, not in Maltman, in Renaissance Christian Kabbalah of the 16th and 17th centuries, you do have images of the Trinity that identify it as Keter Chachman Bina, you know, within the image of the Trinity. That is a 16th century point. I really skipped in some ways from the 4th to the 20th, but if I had taken a stop on the 16th, that is one of the directions the 16th went into for a divergence. And then as we come out into the 18th, 19th, we have a divergence again in which Christianity rejected Christian Kabbalah and everything that went through it. And there are a whole bunch of church edicts of the 19th century against Christian Kabbalah, against perennialism or any of those ideas. Liz, if you'd like to pose your question. Yes, uh, my question has to do with um, the Jewish thinking of God and um, uh, the Shekhinah um, or Logos or Devar. Are these created uh, extensions of God, emanations? I'm not quite sure how the thinking goes with that. So for Jews, it's both. If you're Sa'ad Yagon in the 10th century, a Kalamic philosopher, they are created entities. If you are, on the other hand, Nachmanides in the 13th century, it is an emanated hierarchy. 
for Christian for Christianity, neither of those positions, because both of them are hierarchical, were mm -hmm. rejected by the church councils. And therefore, that's really where the, the difference remains located for the last 1600 years. So for the thinking of them being emanations, are they of the same essence, but of a lesser quality? So there is then a debate, not on the philosophic side, whom it's not the same essence, but on the those who assume it's an, an emanation, there are those who think it's the same essence and those who think it's a, not the same essence. Okay that it's only an instrumental thing to be created. It's a classic debate within Kabbalah, whether the entire emanation scheme is essential or it is um, vessels. It is only a lesser oh. created objects. Thank but you. Judaism gets into these debates. What are these interdivine structures in a way that creedal, Creedal Christianity will not start asking what is the Holy Spirit, what is the Son. It's already set, this is the creed. Right, within creedal Christianity, but then there are the other forms as well that have different kinds of uh, views. Yes, and that's why tonight I aimed it at the creedal. I'm here at, at Seton Hall. You yeah. know me, I'll just as well add the non-creedal column to my blackboard <laughs> charts and we could go forward. Thank you. That was very helpful. Father January, you can un unmute and ask your question. Thank you, Dr. Alan Brill, for these wonderful lectures. You did say that during the post polemic era, of uh, Arianism, Modernism, Monotheism, and the rest. Please, may I know from your own perspective, was that era point of divergence or convergence? That's one. Secondly, uh, from the foregoing, from your lectures, I've, I am able to appreciate the effort you've made to reconcile the Jewish understanding and the Christian understanding of the Trinity. So it's, it's not an easy one, but you, you, you approached it scholarly. I am thinking that um, the missing link is that people, so to speak, have not been able to appreciate that uh, the Trinity is as a result of divine revelation in uh, and the functionality of God in different uh, circumstances, so to speak. So I want you to throw more light. Okay, the, so I'm going to answer both of them. Thank you. The answer the second one first, I could have quoted more from Cardinal Casper who opens very clearly the Trinity is a Christian understanding of revelation, and it is different even though Cardinal Casper, whom I've met many times and is, a, is one of the leading people in Jewish Christian reconciliation and has read, you know, as much Jewish thought as any Cardinal has, clearly says the Trinity formulation is a revelation of a unique creedal Christian version even though he can now see these parallels and he deals with it. Casper is writing post Rahner, post Maltman, post all of it. Casper has read Heschel and Rosenzweig and Soloveitchik, but still says it's a special revelation for Christianity. And I'm not downplaying that. I just was only, it was just my topic to go through the Casper, how he sums it up. Um, Convergence versus divergence, it really differ, differ, meaning during the third, fourth centuries, you have serious divergence. In the eighth, ninth, 10th century, once again, you have serious divergence uh, happening. 
in the 16th century, you have convergence. It was then mainly forgotten for many reasons. Those formulations didn't, the Renaissance formulations didn't continue within mainstream creedal traditions. In the late 20th century, you have convergence, if for no other reason that almost every Catholic university in the United States, over 40 of them, have a professor of Jewish studies on the faculty. So therefore, in the formation of contemporary creedal thinking, they've been exposed to not just Jewish books, but actually Jewish faculty members. Gregorian and Angelicum in Rome have Jewish faculty members, and it has really changed on that sense. And on the other hand, you have Jews studying in various divinity schools, uh, Christian texts. So the convergence is now that we now speak each other's languages, we read each other's books, we know how to explain each other's books, not that anyone's downplaying the specific uniquenesses of the covenants, but we now, we're now able to read each other in a very different way and see where the commonalities are. In Heschel's own lifetime, you wouldn't have really had any um, Catholic clergy that could read Heschel so carefully with knowledge of rabbinic texts of Talmud and Midrash as Maltman could, let alone Casper and anyone after that point, um, and vice versa. Martin, if you'd like to pose your question. Sure. Um, first of all, Rabbi Brill, thank you for uh, your erudite and, and, and brilliant discourse. Um, and I'll, I'll throw out a question. I'm not sure uh, how to structure the question uh, and its appropriateness to your, your comments, but I'll throw it out anyway. Um, in, in, read, uh, in reading Paul Nittner, about the different theologies of religion, um, if it ultimately distills down to in Christianity, Christianity and Catholicism, that the only way, the path to God, is through Jesus Christ, and the only way to salvation is through Jesus. Doesn't the discussion of a uh, Jewish understanding of the Trinity or the tr or Christian understanding? of Juno monotheism, doesn't it break down at that point? Because it almost seems like it's set up that that's an obstacle or a barrier that can't be overcome. Okay, so I'll take that one. I know Nitter personally. I'm not sure that's not his actual thing. And it's actually the sort of problem that, you know, um, Avery Cardinal Darlis bothered him about what are the strengths of the positions. First of all, there are different if we're sticking to Catholicism, different positions of how non-Catholics non are saved, whether it is through Christ, the working of the Holy Spirit, there are different models of how it works. But if I went back to sticking to what we're dealing with here, Rahner assumes that everyone is saved through Christ, but Christ is given as a uh, natural, supernatural within everybody's personhood from birth, meaning everybody has a horizon of being a human being that is now called by Christ to, re to um, reach the transcendent, which is the salvation, meaning Christ is already working through all human beings. Rahner denies it. it can't be general, it's got to be Christ, but Rahner says this um, natural, supernatural works in all people, and he has a term called the anonymous Christian, that even people who are non-Christian and don't know it are being saved. Paul Nitter does not like that idea. There's a huge literature out there, some form of Paul Nitter versus Rahner, 
but understand where you fall, whether you like it or not, is a different story. We can then go to another approach, which a little less safe, which will be the approach of Peter Fan and many others, in which it's not the uh, Christ is working, but the Holy Spirit takes on mysterious ways through all people, and they play that that out of how that applies to Asian enculturation and, and other issues. Um, I deal with these topics in my Encountering Other Religions course, which will be next semester. Um, Maltman, on the other hand, remember he's not Catholic, he's Protestant, does allow a inclusivism in which Jews can have some sort of their own calling. Not a pluralism, but he will have a greater place for a separate, he doesn't use that term dual covenant, but we're both working off of the same revelation to the world and Jews could have their own unique version of it. And that's why he's much more comfortable at many points saying, oh, but the Jewish position is like this and the Jewish position is like that. And then coming back paragraph later and saying, you know, working with it. Yeah, so as a, as a perhaps as a follow up quick question. So as a Jew, can I be an Orthodox Jew and understand the Trinity, Trinityism as a, a philosophical understanding and still have agreement uh, as a Jew with a Christian? Or can I still be a Orthodox Jew and still accept the Trinity? So that's why I put in carefully chose my words as a philosophic theological point is not the same as a credo liturgical and salvation point. The question is that the point is not whether, you know, like uh, Isaac Abelard can say in the Middle Ages, if the Trinity means this, I'll, I'll accept it, which means, you know, the 13th century Isaac Abelard could accept a version of Rahner. That's not the point. If you actually believe you've got to have a acceptance of the creed to be saved, that's where the difference comes in. And that's a very different discussion. Understood. Thank you. Because then it's not because then it's not the philosophic position. It's a liturgical credo one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. James, if you'd like to uh, un unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, James. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you, Alan, for a stimulating lecture. Uh, my question has to do with your comments about this being a contemporary post polemical world that we live in to the degree that we're also living in a post-denominational pluralistic world in ways that uh, in the 21st century, um, where I think more credence may have to be given to, let's say, the those traditions, those free church traditions that actually never have held the creeds and the councils in such esteem as as uh, the two groups, Reformed and Catholic, that you've mentioned. I know you alluded to the Anabaptist and to the yeah. Oneness Christians, but now I'm even pushing it further to, you know, to for the 21st century and conversations that we're having post-colonial, you know, African theologians, um, that whole world, it feels a little bit I would like your just a brief. I know you can't get into it, and you you this was primarily for a different audience potentially. But I would like to hear how you're thinking about a post-denominational, post-creedal world that we are currently living in. That for some, these kind of discussions sound like dancing angels dancing on the head of a pin, when they're already way beyond the, this idea of creeds. Uh, so, I anyway, any thoughts that you have to share in general, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. I have a lot of thoughts, but you understand my context in a Catholic yeah. university with Catholic training, you know, and Catholic audiences speaking, for, you know, primarily to creedal contexts. If I was in a seminary 
where it was already post credo, I would have a lot, you know, worked out much more, um, much more what to say. My starting point, just so you know where I would be coming from. Um, my starting point would be closer to analyzing. Well, my oldest starting point would have probably been Panikar, who started going in those directions and then moving it forward to now all the new, you know, global trends and post creel trends. But at the end of the, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not going to, I'm not looking to wind up to say we're all saying the same thing because we're, we're not, we're actually not, but there still becomes the, you know, how, how do we go about formulating it? And that's where I would start it. But I mean, I'm, I'm in some way have usually this context. You can ask me in a different context and I will give you a, a lo much, lo much longer answer for, I mean, if you actually, since you're, you got me going, the, I would probably start after Panikar, my next reader, person I would read would probably be um, Richard Kearney and Anatheism, followed by uh, Catherine Keller and Drew, who's doing a lot, the Drew who's doing a lot, and those would be my starting point for my discussion, but that's a very different lecture. Thank you, though. Well, if there are no more questions, we'd like to thank you, Rabbi mm -hmm. Burrell, and uh, we all want to thank everyone for attending tonight's lecture. At this time, I would like to ask Dr. Rachel Slutsky, the Monsignor John Osterreicher Visiting Assistant Professor of Jewish Studies and Jewish Christian Relations in Antiquity to offer the closing prayer. Thank you very much for this honor um, and congratulations, uh, Rabbi Dr. Brill, um, for a wonderful, wonderful lecture. Um, I think it's perhaps in the spirit of um, of sharing uh, these types of texts and theologies um, together that I would like to read Psalm 133, um, which uh, it can be debated whether this sentiment is supposed to be among Jews themselves but I think in the spirit of this talk, it is most appropriate thinking about Jews and Christians in theological dialogue together. Um, I'll read the Psalm in Hebrew followed by the English. Shir ha'ma'alot le'david, hine matov u'manaim shevet achim gam yachad. Al harosh yored al hazakan, zakan aharon, sheyored al pi midotav, kashemen hatov, tiva adonai et habracha chayim ad olam. A Song of Ascents, O David, how good and how pleasant it is that brothers dwell together. It is like fine oil on the head running down onto the beard, the beard of Aaron that comes down over the collar of his robe, like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the mountains of Zion. There the Lord ordained blessing, everlasting life. Thank you very much. Thank you all for attending. I believe that concludes tonight's discussion. Take care.